gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our speaker this Shabbat, a special guest, not, uh, not local to us at all. He travels to be with us from Eretz Yisrael. Uh, he is a Jewish educator, an Israel educator, a teacher, really, in all forms. And you, chances are, if you've traveled to Israel at some point in the last, let's say, 20 years with North Shore Congregation Israel or with JUF, uh, you will likely have encountered uh, my colander at some point along the way or the entire way along the way. I had the great pleasure of meeting Mike in 2016 on a trip to Israel with North Shore Congregation Israel. He traveled to Israel with Rabbi Stephen Patty Mason any number of times back, let's call it, in the good old days. <laughs> <laughs> or the, yes, either, either way it is to go, but there are many who are here tonight, <coughs> excuse me, who know Mike personally, and if you don't, you are in for a treat uh, because you will surely learn and be inspired by his words. So with no further ado, my friend, my teacher, Mike Hollander. Shabbat Shalom, and I thought I was just coming to say Miles and uh, Sloan Mazaltov. Um, it actually was a confession. My eldest son had his bar mitzvah on this parsha just a few years ago, uh, 14, if I remember. Um, and it's really one of my favorite parsha. So I hope what I say has nothing to do with what you two are going to say tomorrow. And if it does, just say it again, because most people won't remember what I said anyway. So Shabbat Shalom. Nice to see a wonderful, uh, wonderful crowd here on the, on the North Shore. Um, I always want to center myself and the people I meet. Um, we're trying to understand where we are. Um, yes, we're in the North Shore. Yes, it's the end of uh, January, the middle of January, I should say. But where are we in our story? We're right at the end of Breshit. We're right at the end of Genesis, which in many ways is a wonderful uh, introduction to our annual cycle because it takes us from the universal to the particular, from creation to the specific story of our family, um, warts and all. And this, you guys don't want to talk about that tomorrow. But the good points about being part of a family and the negative parts, things like jealousy and sibling rivalry and favorites and stuff that you guys don't know anything about and nobody else around here has any concept about either. Um, but it really it introduces us and it goes from that big universal idea to the particular idea of a family. And right at the end of the Parsha, our patriarch Jacob, who happens to be my middle name, who goes by another name, you guys know his other name? Israel, you can, have, you can call a friend, by the way, or family, which is nice about having a bar mitzvah and a bat mitzvah. But our patriarch Jacob, the last of the three, is on his deathbed, and he summons in his favorite son, Joseph. Now, why was Joseph the favorite son? Those who haven't traveled with me know that, and Bruce knows this, I ask you a lot of questions. It had to do with his clothing, and that's maybe why I chose to wear this very bright shirt tonight. Because Joseph, as you might know, had an amazing Technicolor dream coat. But, well, because he was his father's favorite, because he really, he was the first son born of the true love of the two wives and two concubines that he had, but of his true love, Rachel. And so Joseph was his favorite. If you don't remember, and you haven't read all of the book of Genesis, then I refer to you to Donny Osmond in that great show, <laughs> Um, Joseph and his amazing Technicolor dream coat. And just as he's about to die, he invites in Joseph and Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and he says, when I go, I don't want to be buried in this foreign place called Egypt, but rather I want you to take me back to be buried with my fathers, we would say mothers, but the Bible says fathers, in the land of Israel, in Canaan. Okay, it's not yet called the land of Israel because he's, they're still there, but the land of Canaan. So he tells Joseph and his sons the following. He says, V'natati et ha'aretz, and he quotes God, that God tells him previously, V'natati et ha'aretz, and I gave this land, Hazot, l'zarecha, acharecha, achuzat olam. And I give this land to you and to all of your offspring for an eternal possession. Now, how many of you, by the way, have ever been to Israel? And I'm not going to name and shame, but the rest of you who didn't raise your hands haven't been to Israel. There's still places, I think, and end of March, or in the next trip that Rabbi Geffen leads to Israel. But uh, it's not just the land that I live in and my wife and my three kids and nine million other Israelis, but it's the land of all of us. If we share the story, you guys are going to get up here, and I assume you're going to talk a little bit about what you're reading, right, tomorrow? That's good. Then you are connected to that land as well. You might not have ever been there, but it is our land. Wherever we live, wherever we celebrate Shabbat, wherever we, we read Torah, wherever we celebrate our annual cycle, it's the exact same story of our family that is intimate, intimately and intricately connected to the land of Israel. 
And then Jacob comes and he asks his son Joseph to bring in his two sons to bless them. Now, I don't know how many of you have the opportunity. I don't because I'm here and my sons are on the, my kids are on the other side of the world in Israel. But I don't know how many of you bless your children on Friday um, around the Shabbat table. But it's a tradition that we do um, back home. Uh, and it's a beautiful tradition that we love because... It reminds us every single week about who our children are and how diverse those children are and the various blessings that they bring to us, the boys as well as the girl. And he says, May God bless you as Ephraim Muminasha. And when we continue, millennia later, we saw the exact same words as Jacob said on his grandchildren. Um, and then he continues and he blesses, he calls in his 12 sons and he blesses each of the 12 sons. And each one is a little bit different, and each one is a slightly different character. Um, and he describes sometimes in one or two lines, sometimes in a little bit more, the character and the diversity of his 12 sons. Any of you, by the way, have, have 12 sons or more? <laughs> this is not the Mormon. Okay, I didn't think so. But um, 12 sons is a lot. He also had a daughter. Um, but he blesses each of them. And as we end the beginning, as we end the first of the five books of Moses, realize we're going from creation to the family saga. And the family saga of 12, of 12 brothers, each of whom are a little bit different, each of different characters. Some are stronger, some are weaker, some, are, some never listen to their parents, some are their favorites, some listen to their parents. And it always reminds me of who we are as a people millennia, millennia later. You've probably been following lately in Israel how we're in a bit of a deadlock, unlike your society where everybody agrees on everything, right? Right. Now, it's actually some similarities. So you've got about half the people who believe one thing and the other half who believe the other thing, and never the two shall meet. Well, in Israel, you might not be aware, but we've actually are on our way to having three elections in a year's time, which is too, too many, if you ask me. Um, and we're deadlocked. We're deadlocked because Israelis, very much like Americans, have kind of returned to their tribal positions, their tribal silos. Um, and you might have heard a few years ago our president, Ruby Rivlin, speak about the four tribes of Israel. Anybody hear his speech on four tribes? And you probably thought that this guy didn't do well in Bible in school because even though he's the president of Israel, we have 12 tribes way back when, but now he's only speaking about four tribes. In all of Israel, he says there are four different groups of people who generally live in their own worlds and study in their own schools and watch their own TV stations and speak their own language and associate with the people of their type. Four tribes based on the four educational systems we have in Israel. One is the state secular system where people go to school, they study the Bible, it's history, it's not the word of God, they, there's no prayer in school. They speak Hebrew, of course. They learn math in Hebrew. They even play sports in Hebrew. They learn, I can't say that in front of the children, but they learn everything in Hebrew, uh, but it's a secular school. Then there's another group of people, and in many ways that is represented by the city of Tel Aviv. There's another group of people who go to state public religious schools where Hebrew is a language of instruction, but there is prayer and there is the Bible taught, the same Bible, but it's taught from a different perspective. In the religious schools, it's taught as the word of God, whereas in the secular schools, it's... Jewish history, maybe more like what we would learn in the reform movement in the United States. And they're separate schools. There's a third public school system for the 20% of Israelis who are not Jewish. They're Arabs. And they study math and PE and English eventually, but in the Arabic language. And they actually study the Bible as well, believe it or not. Many Israeli Arabs are probably more fluent in Hebrew and Israeli, uh, and Israeli poetry than most Americans American Jews or any Jew pretty much who lives outside of Israel, but they have a separate school system. And then there's a fourth group of Israelis, the ultra-Orthodox, who are about 10% of Israel, and they study in their own separate school systems. And they study, well, they don't study what everybody else studies, and they study in a different language from everybody else, they study in Yiddish. And they have different curricula than the other three groups, but everybody lives in their community, whether it's the ultra-Orthodox in the town of Bnei Brak or Jerusalem, or the Arabs in the towns of Umm al-Fakham and many other Arab towns, and the secular Tel Avivians, and the modern Orthodox who live, let's say, in Efrat in Judea, Samaria, the West Bank, and everybody kind of lives in their own little tribe and doesn't really have that much to do with each other, except a little bit later when they go into the military, well, wait a minute, Mike, but two of those four tribes don't actually go into the military, right? The ultra-Orthodox and the Israeli Arabs. So the secular and religious get to, get to know each other, but the other two don't. That's Ruby Rivlin, our president's suggestion as to how Israeli society is divided, and our challenge is to try to figure out the greater commonality than the lesser difference between them. But I would challenge our president, even though I'm not the president, I'm just humbly speaking to you here in the North Shore of Lake Michigan, but 
Actually, aren't we on the west shore of... Okay, you guys can clarify that one for me a little bit later. But there are actually, in my opinion, five tribes in Israel. Similar, but a little bit different to the president. There is the group of Israelis who are Arabic, Arab speakers, the Arab Israelis, 20%. There are the ultra-Orthodox, who are about 10%. And there are the religious who are about 10%, so about 20% Orthodox Israelis, 20% Arab Israelis. And there are 20% of Israelis who I refer to as the Israeli wasp. I know most of you living in America don't think that you can be Jewish and be a wasp, but it's possible. Because our wasps are a little bit different than your wasps. Our wasps are white. They're Ashkenazi. How many Sephardim in the crowd, by the way? Interesting, not a single one. Usually it's about half, or you know. I mean, not half of the entire audience, but like half of one person. But Jews of Middle Eastern origin, right? They're Jews who are secular, who are, uh, so they're, sorry, they're white, they're Ashkenazi, they're secular. And uh, some people refer to them as seekers of peace. They're very liberal. They think that, you know, these wonderful ideas of universality, of the equality of all men and women together, and we just can get along with our neighbors. And that is one sector of Israeli society. We've got the ultra-Orthodox and Orthodox. We've got the Arabs. We've got the Wasp. And we've got uh, two other very important groups. One are the group of Jews who immigrated to Israel post-1948, the Sephardim, or the Mizrahim, Jews from Morocco, Jews from Tunisia, Jews from Libya, Algeria, Yemen, etc. Very, very different cultural background. They grew up in the Islamic world. They don't believe in these wonderful, liberal, universalist ideas that the rest of us perhaps might, might believe in. And there is a fifth group in Israel. A group of people who immigrated to Israel in the past generation or so from the former Soviet Union, um, oftentimes are referred to as the Russians, but it's a bit of a mistake because only some of them are Russians. Many of them are Ukrainians and Lithuanians and Estonians and many other, and Poles as well. Um, and so we've got five different groups in Israel. They live in different areas, they speak different languages to each other, they study in different school systems as well. Um, and I think our challenge in Israel is that on the one hand, like in your society, people are much more entrenched in their own particular silos and their particular communities. But on the other hand, if Jacob was able to bestow upon his 12 sons a blessing, understanding their character and blessing them as to where they would go and how they would work toward the future, I think our challenge is to figure out how we can take those tribes and focus a little bit more both in our society that is Israel and your society that is America, and focus a little bit more on our commonality. As we sit around, and hopefully either tonight or in future Friday evenings when you sit around your family and you bless your children, look at each of your children and realize that each of them brings something different, literally and figuratively, to the table. Bless them for who they are, bless them for what they have, and reflect on the fact that we as a people, wherever we are, in whatever language we speak, continue at about the same time that Miles and Sloan are gonna be reading Torah tomorrow to tell the exact same story about the diversity of all of us as a people here, and even more so in Israel. So if you haven't signed up for the trip, this is an advertisement, Rob, but if you haven't, please do so, or come another time. I know Patty and Steve still take some uh, groups to Israel as well, but see it for yourselves, and Bruce, the diversity of Israel. Um, and as all of Israel, like our family story, um, in many ways, although it was Joseph who wore the coat of many colors, I think we as a people, wherever we are, continue to wear a coat of many colors. Shabbat